Thank you very much. Um, I'd also like to extend my thanks to, uh, to Chris and the State Department, as well as the Secure World Foundation, for the invitation to present to you this morning. Um, I'd like to pre present a perspective from a new United Nations activity uh, under the context of the Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space. Um, promoting, I guess, uh, a backdrop to uh, previous works on looking at the long-term sustainability of outer space, but now recognizing the international importance of space weather in its own right. And currently, I serve as the chairman of that expert group and also the rapporteur to uh, the copious um, technical committee. So we've heard a lot already this morning uh, about space weather and its impacts. Uh, I'll return to this comment later in my presentation, but I think it's true to say that, that space weather has really undergone kind of a um, significant development in the technological understanding of impacts as well as the underlying science. Uh, and I think now is the right time to exploit that new knowledge to ensure that we are appropriately prepared and that we can protect critical infrastructure as we move forward. So this has been mentioned a few times already. I guess probably the um, standard reference point of an extreme space weather event goes back to the 1859 Carrington event and the observations of uh, large flares on the sun and then subsequent impacts on the Earth. Of course, 1859 was a very different technological society than the one in which we live in now, but nonetheless there are um, reliable accounts uh, from that time of um, power lines, uh, telecommunication lines setting on fire as a result of uh, induced currents, and strong, strong activity, which of course we'd like to understand the impacts uh, if such an event were to happen in modern society. So I think this uh, view graph is intended to show two things. Um, first of all, um, just to explain what you're seeing here, this is from the so-called Halloween storm in 2003, and it's showing a series of measured geomagnetically induced currents from a model network across the European sector. And you can see the size of those circles is representative of the strength of the GICs. And what you see, I guess, across the Scandinavian sector and Sweden in particular are very large circles that develop in response um, to that particular storm. In in fact, this period is characteristic of the Malmo power failure that, uh, that Sweden then suffered uh, during this interval. And I guess by um, comparison to 1859, this was a, a, a strong storm, but certainly not of the same uh, size as would be experienced if an 1859 storm were to arrive. But the, the message you should take from this is, of course, that these networks are interconnected, very strongly interconnected. Um, across all levels of society, this is just really showing you the electric power grid. So I think it's very important for us to understand the international context of this. It's not a, a single country or even a single region that faces a space weather threat. It really is a global uh, aspect that we need to understand together. So I guess returning to this concept about risk, um, the number of people are undertaking and have undertaken space weather risk studies, the largest of which uh, in the US in 2008 came up with a, a number of one to two trillion dollars as the potential economic consequence of a, a Carrington-like event. Um, I think more recent studies suggest that number might be large, but it's certainly a very, very significant potential impact. I think the other important thing to note is that the uh, likelihood of these events is also now understood to be much more um, highly likely than would be previously the case. And so again, we need to take this very, very seriously. So as I was mentioning, the, the uh, impacts of a severe event could be very large. But I think the other message that I want to, to kind of present to you is that even moderate space weather events have an impact. Those impacts need to be understood, and we need to be able to mitigate them. So it's not just the case that we should be waiting for a, you know, the skies falling kind of an event and wondering how frequently that might occur 100 years or 1,000 years. There are more regular. Uh, standard run-of-the-mill, you might say, space weather activities which also have impacts which we need to understand. And it's obvious now that the way forward is to understand the science better as well as to understand the applied science better so that we can understand the impacts, model the impacts, and then take appropriate action to mitigate those effects. Now, um, just as a, an aside here, I enjoyed a, a nice time on the National Mall yesterday in advance of this meeting, and I found myself uh, in, the, in the Jefferson uh, Monument, uh, and I read this uh, quote. I don't think Jefferson had the idea of uh, space weather in mind uh, uh, when he wrote this, but it's actually an interesting comment. Uh, I won't read the, the quote to you, but the gist is that as we develop our understanding, um, then we need to respond appropriately with appropriate institutions and to take appropriate action 
Commission. And so I would say that uh, right now we're at the situation where space weather is in that category. We should take account of our new knowledge and we should take uh, action appropriately, uh, collectively with our international colleagues. So let me talk uh, more specifically then about the expert group. Um, was formed in 2015, um, and basically we have a defined mandate, uh, a focus, and we're seeking to really develop definitive outcomes as a result of this discussion. Uh, and I want to comment really that the focus is to raise awareness amongst the member states of Copious um, at the national level to try to promote uh, better understanding of space weather and better understanding of what actions could be taken in individual member states to try to mitigate that risk uh, in a coordinated way, in a way that uh, efficiently uses the resources in individual countries and which takes advantage of um, expertise that exists in those different administrations. So there's some significant heritage to this. I mentioned the activity, it's still ongoing. Uh, within the UN right now on long-term sustainability of outer space, but the space weather piece was uh, completed in 2015, and there are published guidelines reflecting um, actions which could be taken to um, mitigate some of the space weather effects. The member states recognized the value of this activity moving forward, and then endorsed uh, through the permanent space weather agenda item the activity under this expert group. And I think, particularly with a view to, to this afternoon's discussions, this is a new expert group and we do have an opportunity to define uh, how it should move forward and the best way to constitute its actions. And I very much welcome the opportunity to interact with many of you in that discourse. So, We've started our work. Um, we had a very successful meeting in February, combined a three-day workshop with an expert group meeting. Um, we've identified some opportunities in relation, in particular, to geomagnetically induced currents, um, and referenced some other international activities which have recently been completed, in particular the Coast Bar ILWS roadmap. And I want to say a few words about that uh, activity, just because uh, nobody has discussed it yet too much uh, this morning, and I think it's very important. Um, but we're already identifying user needs and I think the GIC aspect, the electrical power grid aspect, is really an area where there is a strong opportunity for this expert group to make some um, significant impacts moving forward. So just to say a few words, uh, uh, this slide just doesn't project uh, very well, but the, this was about a two or three year activity that involved, in fact, a number of colleagues in this room, uh, as well as from around the world, to produce a scientific strategy for improving space weather um, capacity moving forward in the next decade. And a question was raised from the audience earlier about um, uh, advance warning and how much notice we might get from a, a severe space weather storm. So one of the things that this roadmap team took into account was to address what science and what measurements would we need to provide uh, greater than one to two hour advance notice of a severe space weather event. So that we'd know about it before it got to L1 and then maybe we would have more time to be able to take appropriate action. And that was the, the, the task that's been spent. Uh, the outcome is published in Advances in Space Research. I won't go through the details, but you can look it up for yourself. Um, there's a number of recommendations here, which I won't, won't go through one by one, but the overarching theme in a number of these elements is the importance of international coordination on measurements, on understanding the impacts on systems, on then taking steps towards increased preparedness. Uh, and this really is something that I would strongly recommend to you. I think it's something we can take advantage of and we should use as we move forward in our activities. Um, there was also a recommendation in relation to new infrastructure as well as continuing infrastructure uh, and the roadmap team took some steps to look at not only the electrical power grid problem but also some aspects in relation to space radiation and in relation to impacts on um, aviation and the ionosphere that have already been mentioned. So I guess let, let's just uh, take a, a step back and focus on um, what the expert group is focusing on right now. So GICs is our primary focus immediately, trying to identify the importance of research as well as the importance of continuing op observational and modeling capabilities. 
Um, we really had a very strong and active GIC workshop in February, and I think the message that came through long, loud and clear was the regional impacts of um, GICs. They're not the same in different geographic regions, and different countries can be influenced in different ways. And probably the most important message is, I think, that in order to reflect that, individual nations should be undertaking a socio-economic impact survey. Uh, we heard from Mark earlier about the UK's efforts in this regard, and I think this is very, very important for the international endeavour as we, as we move forward. Each country needs to understand how they will be affected and how they should then take appropriate action within the context of the overall international endeavour. Um, the, the bottom bullet here was mentioned right at the very introduction to this meeting and it's worth repeating, I think, that certainly even countries that have an apparently low domestic space weather risk are part of this interconnected global technological infrastructure. And therefore, even though they're direct impacts from space matter might be modest, their indirect impacts could be equally strong uh, and they will be affected by them as a result of that indirect uh, connectedness. So I'm just drawing to, to the conclusion of my slides here. There are growing national and international activities in space weather. I think that there's a role within the United Nations to promote space weather uh, that's complementary, for example, to uh, the activities within WMO uh, that J Jerome described and other organizations. But it's important to put them in the right uh, context. And I think that the United Nations could be a strong platform for, for making significant advances, especially in the build-up to Unispace Plus 50 in 2018, which will define the priorities for the United Nations going forward for the next 30 years or so. Um, so I think we need to be thinking about the next steps. Um, we need international coordination. We should think how that can be achieved. One possibility might be through an action team type approach. Uh, there's a good example, Action Team 14, from uh, looking at near-Earth objects, a warning network activity, or through IADC in relation to space debris. They've been very successful activities within the UN. Maybe now is the time to focus on space weather for a similar type of activity. Uh, and ultimately, our goal, of course, is critical infrastructure protection, um, not just in individual nations, but uh, across the whole globe. So thank you very much much for your attention.